of an SS Tiger I tank in France World War II forced armies to integrate all the available arms at every level into a mobile, flexible team. The mechanized combined arms force came of age in this war. In 1939, most armies still doubt of an armored division as a mass of tanks with relatively limited support from the other arms. By 1943, the same armies had evolved armored divisions that were a balance of different arms and services, each of which had to be as mobile and almost as protected as the tanks they accompanied. This concentration of mechanized forces in a small number of mobile divisions left the ordinary infantry unit deficient in armor to accompany their deliberate attack. The German, Soviet, and American armies therefore developed a number of tank surrogates such as tank destroyers and assault guns to perform these functions in cooperation with the infantry. Armor experts in most armies, however, were determined to avoid being tied to the infantry, and in any event a tank was an extremely complicated, expensive, and therefore scarce weapon. The British persisted for much of the war on a dual track of development retaining infantry tanks to support the infantry and lighter, more mobile cruiser tanks for independent armored formations. The Soviets similarly produced an entire series of heavy brakes threatening stop during the war. German tank design went through at least three generations, plus constant minor variations. The first generation included such pre-war vehicles as the Panzerkampfwagen, or Panzer, Iron II, which were similar to Soviet and British light tanks. The Germans converted their tank battalions to a majority of Panzer III and Panzer IV medium tanks after the 1940 French campaign. The appearance of large numbers of the new generation T-34 and KV-1 Soviet tanks that were unknown to Germans until 1941, compelled them to join a race for superior armor and gunpower. The third generation included many different variants, but the most important designs were the Panther, Panzer V, and Tiger, Panzer VI, tanks. Unfortunately for the Germans, lack of resources combined with emphasis on protection and firepower and a palm sham for overly complex design philosophies in near livery part of an armored fighting vehicle's design compromised the production numbers. However, an gun casemate hull development of the Panzer III, the Sturmgesse Schutz III, would turn out to be Germany's most produced armored fighting vehicle of any type during the war, at just over 9,300 examples, a popular design which could also be very effectively tasked to perform the duties of a dedicated anti-tank vehicle. The alternative to constant changes in tank design was to standardize a few basic designs and mass produce them even though technology had advanced to new improvements. This was the solution of Germany's principal opponents. The Soviet T-34, for example, was an excellent basic design that survived the war with only one major change in armament, 76.2mm to 85mm main gun. The United States had even more reason to standardize and mass produce than did the Soviet Union. By concentrating on mechanical reliability, the U.S. was able to produce vehicles that operated longer with few repair parts. To ensure that American tanks were compatible with American bridging equipment, the War Department restricted tank width and maximum weight to 30 tons. The Army relaxed these requirements only in late 1944. When Germany invaded Western Europe in 1940, the U.S. Army had only 28 new tanks, 18 medium and 10 light and these were soon to become obsolete, along with some 900 older models on hand. The Army had no heavy tanks and no immediate plans for any. Even more serious than the shortage of tanks weighs industry's lack of experience in tank manufacture and limited production facilities. Furthermore, the United States was committed to helping supply its allies. 
by 1942 American tank production had soared to just under 25,000, almost doubling the combined British and German output for that year. And in 1943, the peak tank production year, the total was 29,497. All in all, from 1940 through 1945, U.S. tank production to Taled 88,410. Tank designs of World War II were based upon many complex considerations, but the principal factors were those thought to be best supported by combat experience. Among these, early combat proved that a bigger tank was not necessarily a better tank. The development goal came to be a tank combining all of the proven characteristics in proper balance, to which weight and size were only incidentally related. The key characteristics were mechanical reliability, firepower, mobility and protection. The problem here was that only a slight addition to the thickness of armor plate greatly increased the total weight of the tank, thereby requiring a more powerful and heavier engine. This, in turn, resulted in a larger and heavier transmission and suspension system. Just this sort of vicious circle aimed at upgrading a tank's most vital characteristics tended to make the tank less maneuverable, slower, and a larger and easier target. Determining the point at which the optimum thickness of armor was reached, in balance with other factors, presented a challenge that resulted in numerous proposed solutions and much disagreement. According to Lieutenant General Leslie J. McNair, Chief of Staff of GHQ, and later Commanding General, Army Ground Forces, the answer to bigger enemy tanks was more powerful guns instead of increased size. Since emphasis of the using arms was upon light tanks during 1940 and 1941, their production at first weighs almost 2 to 1 over the mediums. But in 1943, as the demand grew for more powerful tanks, the lights fell behind, and by 1945 the number of light tanks produced was less than half the number of mediums. In 1945-46, the General Board of the U.S. European Theater of Operations conducted an exhaustive review of past and future organization. The tank destroyer was deemed too specialized to justify in a peacetime air force structure. In a reversal of previous doctrine, the U.S. Army concluded that the medium tank is the best anti-tank weapon. Although such a statement may have been true, it ignored the difficulties of designing a tank that could outshoot and defeat all other tanks. The Cold War. In the Cold War. The two opposing forces in Europe were the Warsaw Pact countries on the one side, and the NATO countries on the other side. Soviet domination of the Warsaw Pact led to effective standardization on a few tank designs. In comparison, the major contributors to NATO, France, Germany, the USA, and the UK developed their own tank designs, with little in common. The US M551 Sheridan was used from 1969 to 1997. After World War II, tank development continued. Tanks would not only continue to be produced in huge numbers, but the technology advanced dramatically as well. Medium tanks became heavier, their armor became thicker, and their firepower increased. This led gradually to the concept of the main battle tank and the gradual elimination of the heavy tank. Aspects of gun technology changed significantly as well, with advances in shell design and effectiveness. Many of the changes in tank design have been refinements to targeting and ranging, fire control, gun stabilization, communications, and crew comfort. Armor evolved to keep pace with improvements in weaponry. The rise of composite armor ice off particular note and guns grew more powerful. However, basic tank architecture did not change e significantly, and has remained largely the same into the 21st century. Post Cold War, Russian Koyuni Oriel or Black Eagle features with the end of the Cold War in 1991. Questions once again started sprouting concerning the relevance of the traditional tank. 
Over the years, many nations cut back the number of their tanks or replaced most of them with lightweight armored fighting vehicles with only minimal armor protection. This period also brought an end to the superpower blocks, and the military industries of Russia and Ukraine are now vying to sell tanks worldwide. India and Pakistan have upgraded old tanks and bought new T-84S and T-90S from the former Soviet states. Both have demonstrated prototypes that the respective countries are not adopting for their own use, but are designed exclusively to compete with the latest Western offerings in the open market. Ukraine has developed the T-84-120 Oplot which can fire both NATO 120mm ammunition and AT jeans thruff the gun barrel. It has a new turret with autoloader, but imitates western designs with an armored ammunition compartment to improve crew survivability. The Russian Koyony Oriel, Black Eagle, is based on a lengthened T-80 hull. An early mock-up shown for the first time at the second VTTV Omsk 97 International Exhibition of Armaments in 1997, appears to have dramatically heavier armor, and a completely new modern turret separating crew and ammunition. The prototype has a 125mm tank gun, but is said to be able to mount a new 152mm gun. Russia is also rumored to be developing the Obicht 775 MBT, sometimes called T-95, with a remote-controlled turret for domestic service. The Italian C-1 Air Riot MBT was among the latest all-new MBTs to be fielded, with deliveries running from 1995 to 2002. The tank is nearly the same size of the very first tank, both being 8 feet. 2.5 m high. The Mark I had a tilde 9.9 m long hull, and the Air Riot has a 7.6 forward slash 9.52 m long hull forward slash hull and gun. However, the Air Riot is over double and can travel 10 times faster, 54,000 kg versus 25,401 kg and 40 miles per hour versus 4 miles per hour. 60 v 6 km forward slash h. A number of armies have considered eliminating tanks completely, reverting to a mix of wheeled anti-tank guns and infantry fighting vehicles, IFV, though in general there is a great deal of resistance because all off-grade powers still maintain large numbers of them, in active forces or in ready reserve. There has been a no proven alternative and tanks have had a relatively good track record in recent conflicts. The tank continues to be vulnerable to many kinds of anti-tank weapons and is more logistically demanding than lighter vehicles, but these were trays that were true for the first tanks as well. In direct fire combat they offer an unmatched combination of higher survivability and firepower among ground-based warfare systems. Whether this combination is particularly useful in proportion to their cost is matter of debate, as there also exist very effective anti-tank systems, IFVs, and competition from air-based ground attack systems. Due to vulnerability from RPGs, the tank has always had local defense from machine guns to solve the problem. This partially solved the problem in some cases, but produced another because the machine gun had to be operated by the commander from outside the tank, it made him vulnerable to enemy fire. To solve this problem, gun shields were made to reduce this threat, but did not completely solve the problem. So when the development of the M102 Tusk, Tank Urban Survival Kit, came, the finalization of a remote machine gun came into place, and was one of the first main battle tanks to have one. Other examples of this gun have been seen, such as a 20mm remote cannon on the M60 A2. This remote machine gun, under the name Crows, common remotely operated weapons station, has solved the problem of enemy fire threat to the commander, when operating the machine gun. It can also be equipped with an optional grenade launcher. Possibly one of the main evolution sources for tanks in this century are the active protection systems. 
Until 15 years ago, armor, reactive or passive, was the only effective measure against anti-tank assets. The most ascent active protection systems, including Israeli Trophy and Iron Fist and Russian Arena, offer high survivability even against volleys of RPG and missiles. If these kinds of systems evolve further and are integrated in contemporary tank and armored vehicle fleets, the armor anti-tank equation will change completely. Therefore, 21st century tanks would experience a total revival in terms of operational capabilities. See also History Portal Tanks Portal Tank Classification G Numbers U.S. Tanks Tank Guns Comparison of World War I tanks Tanks of the interwar period Comparison of early World War II tanks Post-Cold War tanks Armored fighting vehicle Cultivator number 6 Notes On the 9th of December 1915 The Bay Good It finished Now it's evening and the camcorders almost uh, finish of power so uh, I will start upload this but I like uh, I like to get started to read about uh, the modern tanks the Challenger 2 Abrams Leopard 2 because of the war in Ukraine they are talking a lot about uh, tanks like the Leopard 2 from Germany and the American Abrams, they will uh, supply them to the Ukrainian in the future. Germany will uh, export Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine and uh, United States, the Abrams. France have modern tanks, Lilac, and Israel, probably not, and Italy. So, uh, but I'll look at this later. Actually, I need a break because I go need to go to bathroom. So I will uh, <coughs> start upload this video, and uh, I will uh, charge the camcorder. Then I will uh, continue tomorrow, uh, Friday.